Uh, we're going we're to move on here. We have uh, a change in schedule. We have a, a Sam Pancholi, unfortunately, uh, has playing connection issues and uh, is unable to be here this morning. So Sunil has uh, graciously offered to, to take Sam's spot and is going to give Sam's lecture on uh, shutting and reopening the door, radial artery occlusions and reopening. So uh, thanks so much, Sunil, for uh, pinch hitting. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I mean, this is uh, humbling to give this talk because a lot of these data are actually original data from Sam, and I certainly uh, am not uh, Sam Pancholi. I'm actually a lot better looking and like a foot taller, actually. But um, no, so I will try my best to do some justice to this. And we have a little bit of a technical issue. We've got to switch over to this laptop, I think, uh, in the back there. Oh, they're up here. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, great. So um, we'll talk about radial artery occlusion prevention and recanalization. These are my uh, disclosures. It's really nothing off-label in this particular talk. Um, so I think the issue here fundamentally is why would you want to care about radial artery occlusion? Um, it's interesting. When we did the, um, the radial survey, international radial survey, a lot of folks were not practicing what we call non-occlusive hemostasis to try and preserve radial artery flow. It was predominantly outside the U.S. where this was occurring. Um, and the issue, I think, it comes down to the controversy over whether or not radial artery occlusion is something that's clinically relevant. In other words, does it actually result in hand ischemia? And second, whether or not the patient would require a repeat procedure. So from my perspective, the reason to preserve the radial artery is not necessarily because uh, of some clinical sequelae. Most radial artery occlusions are asymptomatic, although there have been case reports of some that are not. But really, it's because of the issue of trying to repeat access this patient, who are all, they, they, many patients come back for repeat procedures. If you look historically, and that's shown for you on this slide, this is from an editorial that was in Jack Intervention a few years ago, looking at um, some studies, again, it's a little bit unfair to put all these studies on the same slide, but it's really to drive home a point, which is that in the old days, where we didn't care about radial artery preservation, the rates of radial artery occlusion were well into the 10% range, and they probably were higher in clinical practice. Remember, whenever you do a study of radial artery occlusion, the rates are just going to go down because people are aware that you're measuring them. And shown for you are these different studies that also look at the degree of anticoagulation that was used in each study. Um, and if you look at the original study, which is San Martin's study, the rate of radial artery occlusion, uh, and this is early radial artery occlusion, this is at the time of hospital discharge, was somewhere around 10% uh, late uh, occlusion rates, which is 30 days, were not measured. If you go down to uh, Sudhir Rathor's study, uh, I'm sorry that the, the number is in black there, but it went from nine, it went down to 9%, uh, and then at 30 days it was 7%. So the one other take-home point from this slide is that most, many radial artery occlusions early